Welcome, Christine. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. We are so excited, especially after having Darren Perrin on a few episodes ago, to kind of talk to you about this whole story. So that was back in 2015 when Darren released that. So there must have been a few changes that have happened. Can you fill us in? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think the world changed around me, but <laughs> I don't really feel much different other than very much at peace. You know, so it's, uh, you know, if you look at that, I, I physically transitioned December 2nd on the job. And the uh, Darren story ran in early September. It was really, I talked to Darren probably a month and a half before that, but we agreed we would release it during Pride Week. And then uh, the idea was to give the company time and everybody time, our, our members, the company's board and all that time to just adjust to the fact that this is coming. And then when I transitioned uh, Decem in December, it was kind of like a month of walking on eggshells. You know, everybody was walking on eggshells around me, but, but by January, it, started to just feel like it used to you know and uh, and I was I've been extremely well received um, it, I feel very supported it's of course it's wonderful living here in Vermont because I also do a lot of national work and frankly I feel supported at the national level too but I did hear get some interesting uh, warnings before that transition <laughs> that I would, might lose my ability to do the work on the national level but it turned out it didn't happen I actually feel like I'm even doing more now than I used to. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's it's kind of interesting because being the CEO of uh, Vermont Electric Co-op, you uh, sort of you have a transition date, and a lot of people don't have um, a lot of trans people don't have a specific date that they can say I transitioned on this day um, necessarily. It's more of a process. Um, but because you were at the helm of this company, it was a little bit more. Uh, I don't know, planned? I, Plan how, yeah. very, very planful. Yeah. I will tell you that um, it, it, my whole transition has taken probably about eight years. Right. You know, time for the family to adjust, time to get through all the, all the discussions we needed to for the family to be ready, for my friends to be ready. And then it was about starting in about uh, May of 2015, it really was moving into a business plan. You know, mm -hmm. It was very strategic, very planned. Every every step was really well choreographed from my perspective. That's what I, I knew I needed to do. Because if you what I didn't want people to do when I transitioned, you know, we have we we we're we're the second largest utility. We serve twenty three percent of Vermont. I didn't want our employees or a board or our members to say, what a Dave just go crazy. You know, it's, mm. this was this was very. Don't worry about it, folks. This is this is coming. This is how it's going to be, and uh, and business will go on and will continue to grow it and and evolve as a company. So discussing like transitioning on the job, how was that experience? As you alluded to earlier, it seems like it was a pleasant experience, maybe because of this choreography that you had going on. I think the choreography was very important. I will tell you. You know, I, I have I, I have a kind of a funny relationship with God, you know, and I, I, I always say my God has a, has a twisted sense of humor. <laughs> um, so I have all these things that go on in life that are just funny. And one of the funny things is, why couldn't I be the CEO of a, like an artist retreat? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you had, you had CEO of the, of the most macho business around, right? <laughs> so it was, it was quite the challenge to think through it and figure out how to do this in a good way. And what was interesting is when I Googled, you know, about December of 2014, I started thinking about the business transition and I Googled, okay, who's transitioned on the job as a CEO? Well, I couldn't find anybody. And then this Maxine, I forget her last name, who's the, who's the head of Sirius, you know, she's mm -hmm. a CEO of a major company, but she started the company. So mm -hmm. I really couldn't, you know, I really began to realize I was, I was uh, um, kind of treading new ground. Um, so, kind of had to figure it out. Yeah, it must be your your background as the CEO probably helped you yeah. devise such a plan. Right, uh, right. You know, because as CEO, you're always thinking about you're thinking you know three or twenty steps forward. Right, that's right. That's right. Um, and you know how every single decision is going to impact down the line. So, mm -hmm. um, 
that's probably why it's probably a, a bit atypical mm -hmm. um, your journey probably than than most but um, very inspiring especially being uh, you know out in Lamoille County where I'm from as well um, rural rural Vermont in general it's just it's that is added to it too. Oh, rural Vermont is it so I was at I spent the last week at Pride in California, in San Francisco, you know, so I was out, my daughter lives in San Francisco, Jillian, so I happened to have a meeting in uh, Lake Tahoe, so then I just scheduled time off so I could, we could celebrate Pride together. We had such a wonderful time. And in California, especially the San Francisco area, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. uh, you know, Har Harvey Milk way back kind of yeah. set, set the groundwork, but it's so accepted, so understood, it almost feels like it almost feels like it's a popularity contest more than anything. You know, people, and I'm really happy. A lot of straight people show up. There are a lot of allies, and, and but it's it's a festival. You know, it's got a very festive atmosphere. But there's still a political message. Well, then I come. I'm at a party last night in <laughs> Memorial County, and I I meet this person. You know, and I just talk casually about who I am, and I said, Oh yeah, I was I was uh, last week at Pride, and kind of gives me this look. He says, I, I I'm. You know, I was born and raised Irish Catholic. This stuff is really new and, and different to me. And you know, I get thought he was stumbling. I was yeah. like, you know, so you just, you just see that difference being in a rural area. You know, rural, I'm sure it's a lot worse in rural Alabama. You know, True, but, but, <laughs> true. But, but rural Vermont, I don't get, you know, I did have one run in with somebody at one point. But overall, you just don't get a lot of negative feedback. You just get people just, it's new for them. They haven't, yeah. they haven't experienced it. Right. It's like a learning process for a lot of folks, is, is what I've seen. You know, it's, it's they're very they're open minded in the fact that they're they're willing to mm -hmm. you know speak about it and, and accept it. But it's it they, it comes from a place of unknowing, and and they're mm -hmm. just they're willing to learn, but they're they're just like kind of apprehensive. You know. It's oh well, I I'll tell you the the one the one and I and I certainly won't mention any names because mm -hmm. there was one prominent person in Lamoille County who came in and was yelling at me one day and telling me how weird it was or how weird it was. I said, so I came back to him after he settled down. I said, weird? I said, you don't think I know it's weird? I've been living with this my whole life. I said, yeah. you know, when you think about weird, people use the term weird. Well, we can be offended by that or we can recognize weird just means it's different, right? It's, I've never experienced right. this before. Of course it's weird for you. So it allows me to be empathetic with somebody who might be hostile to me because, mm. yeah, I understand your feeling of weird because you've never run into this before. But let me tell you about me. Yeah, validating their feelings right. and then moving forward. Right, right. Mm -hmm. It's difficult though. Those are some tough conversations that are happening kind of both in our communities and in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, and I love discussing both going across the country to California where things, it's more of a celebration. It's more just festival, as you put it. Um, and then comparing to Vermont where we have those rural settings um, where it's a little more challenging. So thinking of the workplace specifically, what are some of the changes that you feel need to take place for trans workers in the state of Vermont? Well, I do, you know, I, I, I should point out that I, I do come from privilege. You know, when you think about privilege, I, what, I, what I mean specifically is I was the CEO of the company. I I'm a, started out as a white male, you know, and, and, I, and I have a very strong supportive family. Not everybody has that so you know I paint this rosy picture I don't believe it's rosy mm -hmm. at all and I do believe that uh, the, the the workplace uh, as a, tr a trans worker in the workplace should be able to go to human resources and having you know having hu human resource help them choreograph their transition now what's interesting when you talk about human resources I've spoken to a d various um, groups and, and then speaking to the Vermont Human Resource Association, there are human resource managers who, who aren't even prepared for this kind of, of a situation. Now, I will tell you, our human resources department, I'm very proud of them because I'm going to tell you another story is um, I, had, I developed cancer and I had stage three cancer. It was aggressive. I was sure I was going to die. I announced it to the, I told, went, I told the employees personally about the story and the board and the employees were pretty convinced we were all convinced I was going to die. Now I could do that personally but when I went to Human Resources about my transition which was like in July the Human Resource Manager said well Jesus you told the employees about your own death. I said this is harder than telling about my own death. That's what I told her. I said I, I really 
need your help. And they did a great job of doing tremendous amount of research. Now, I believe they did that because they're a great, we have a great human resources department, mm -hmm. not because I was CEO. I think they would have done it with anybody. But it's too often I hear stories where those human resource folks don't do the research and they try to work from their own opinions and their own background and they just don't have the background for something like this I, on the whole. You know, it's something you have to research and study and help. So I don't think workers are receiving the amount of support I'd like them to receive who are, and, I, and the young workers I've talked to, you know, I go to the Transgender Identity Conference every year at UVM really just to help the young folks there and, and uh, too many times I hear the story of people having to leave their job so that's happening in Vermont. Vermont is not, it's a wonderful supportive state, probably the, one of the best in the nation. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, there's work that needs to be done, I think. Something that's really resonating with me that you just said was that it was more difficult to tell your company about your transition rather than telling them that you might be dying from a disease. Like that's so difficult to take in um, and to think about. And yeah, it's, it was, it was imp you know, I. At times I observe my own behavior, I kind of step outside of myself, yeah. and that is very interesting, right? Why was that so hard? I spent five years with counseling. In, I'll go back to the story when I started transgender counseling, kind of in preparation for this transition. I met the counselor, and I, she said, what do, you, what do you want from me? I said, well, I, I'm very strong leader, is Dave, very strong, confident leader, but Christine is kryptonite to Dave. Christine is mm. weak, full of shame. I said, I can't transition as a weak leader. Mm -hmm. So we worked for years, and I did feel when I transitioned in September that I was equally strong as Christine. Like today, I feel like a very strong leader as Christine, and I feel confident. But that was because of the work, that the, the work I did with the counselor. Now, what's interesting is when I had that discussion, I realized there was still a level of shame and a level of weakness there. Mm -hmm. So when I, I said that to our... Uh, to, I really had felt ready, but I clearly was had some more work to do, and I, and I worked with my counselor on that. So by the time I did transition, I was fully ready, December second. Right. So that was when I. It was really a surprise to me that I was not able to do that. Yeah, it seems very difficult, honestly. <laughs> um, and trans is just one piece of your identity. And so I don't want to just focus on yeah, that during this yeah, interview. Um, and another piece of that is an environmentalist. You are very committed to focusing on climate change and the changes that we need to make both in our state and at a national level. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us more about that? Yes, and that's, I'm glad you, you, you talk about that because um, I'm, always, I'm always, you know, I, I really like the work that you're doing in making people aware of, of the struggles of, of the trans community. And I think that's highly important. My, but I, what I'll say about myself is, my, I am going to. My goal is to solve climate change. You know, that's my my life's work is to solve climate change. And I happen to be transgender, so um, it's 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 you know when you think about, I truly believe the world we are destroying the world. And even in the next 10 years, we're already seeing catastrophic changes in climate. And I, and I know the movie, the movie is called Denial for a reason, right? Because, because uh, we have today, we have an administration that's, that denies climate change. Well, you know, we're only about six tenths of a degree centigrade away from the methane hydrates bubbling up from the ocean. And that's gonna cause a step function. Uh, and, 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 you know, you, people don't believe in science, you know, but, but 350, million dollar, 350 million years ago, the exact same thing happened. And, you, and you're able to tell that by the, the, by the ice, camp, ice uh, core samples. And 95% of the species were wiped out on the planet. So I believe we're going to see that happen in the next 10 years. I, I believe, you know, it's, I believe we're there. We're right on the precipice of a massive release of methane which is about 80 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide. Will we survive that? Is that, is that, that sounds very dangerous. It is very dangerous, yes. Oh. I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so methane, so now, now methane like is a gas, me right? Methane is a gas, Okay, yes. and so, how is it? Uh, so are you breaking things. the news so, that yeah. possibly in 10 years we are going to die? Well, I don't know what news. the answer will be, but again, 
as as a as News a, us, a utility manager who yeah. who's very planful. Right. You know, we should we should be making serious plans. Should we turn these lights off? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of lights on. I us. noticed when I came in, these are energy efficient fluorescent okay. lighting. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the LED lights are more efficient, but I, I always I'm always yeah, observing. Yeah, I figured the you're always. But it's you know, can. you know, <laughs> we. I will tell you from a personal standpoint. It, it, now we'll tie it back to the transition story, right? From a personal standpoint, I know that. I personally, and I'm not very effective coming from a place of fear. Fear and anger really destroy our effectiveness as personally and as, as, a, as a species, right? So, so we don't need to fear. I mean, it sounds terrible, but point is plan for it, you know, take, mitigate, start mitigating carbon right away. Um, and, and that's what we need to do, regardless of fact whether our government agrees or not. So when, so when you look at uh, uh, President Trump pulling out of the climate accord, to me that's irrelevant. We can, we can and probably will exceed the requirements of the Paris uh, climate accord in spite of the government. Because it takes every, if every single one of us starts making decisions based on carbon, the marketers and the, and the manufacturers will all change how they market. They'll respond to us just like they do in California. You know, Pride was a great event. Apple was there. All these big people, all these big companies were there because right. they wanted to be there to show that they're supportive of the LGBT community. Well, same thing with the environment. If we, if we, if we st start educating ourselves and make decisions, the food we buy, for example, I'm going to buy a steak tonight. Steak is highly carbon intensive. Now. I, you know, I used to meet, eat meat every day. Now I eat meat maybe once a week or twice a week. Mm -hmm. it, meaning I'm not saying radically cut things out, just start changing. I, I now drive a, a plug-in electric hybrid, you know, transportation. Think about transportation, your home heating, all those kind of things. If we all just start thinking about it, that's how the change will occur. You know, we shouldn't be waiting for our government to change. It's just making the minor changes it, and you think, well, what, what, what impact do I have? I hear some critics say, well, Vermont is only two-tenths of one percent of the national population. What impact do we have? Mm. Well, you do. Every, you know, if you look, look at the way mass marketing is done, it's all about our decision-making. That's how people respond. And, and you can see that, like I say, I'll go back to California and see that just marvelous support for the, the uh, LGBT community. Now we just need marvelous support for, for restoring the earth. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm still caught up on this. Me too. Uh, Ten years. Me too. I'm yeah, like, the so nothing. focused okay, on it. Okay, so 95 percent of all species. Wait, what? Did, what's this fact? This is a fact. Uh, 350 million years ago, when the methane hydrates released the last first time. time. The, no. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The first time. Well, the first. Well, you first, know, I, well, yeah, that's a long time ago. Right? Back 350 yeah. million years. Uh, there's been a couple times in history when big events have occurred right. that have that have really Shifted critically this. rocked the species. Yeah. You know, this is one of those events. So speaking of being in denial, um, which we clearly are, that's the first stage of grief, yeah. um, you, your son actually produced a documentary, Denial. Yes. Um, amazing, by the way. For Thank those you. who haven't seen it, can you tell them more about it? Yes, and it's a, so it's available on, on uh, iTunes and uh, Amazon Video, as well as, you know, that you can get it on satellite. And, and you do some screenings locally occasionally, We've done right? screenings for the past year. In fact, Memorial Day weekend, I was flown out to Spain for and met yes. and for the weekend and met with a bunch of energy activists there. It was all so it's so it's getting it's getting world recognition, but it's not it's not it's not really getting reviews or po it's not necessarily popular, but but it the, the messages are kind of, you know, I'm not sure how you know how uh, mainstream the messages are, mm -hmm. as 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 we're talking about transgender and climate change, right? But but uh, he, my son was, uh, he would go to work with me when he was in high school. You know, I'd be go at a major outage, and he, you know, it'd be eleven thirty at night. Can I go with you on this outage? Sure. And and you know he 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 didn't spend a lot of time in school like others did, but it, but he was but his whole goal was to do film in life. So I honored that goal. And uh, so then he was fascinated by the fact that, because gr all growing up, I, I would talk about climate change and I talk about our impact environment. I'd say to my kids, every time you throw that light switch, you're making an environmental decision. You know, just saying, you know, mm. casual, stupid things you say as a parent. Uh, but apparently, got into the 
kids' heads and got it into his head. And, you know, you'll see that scene in denial when he's, when he's having the child and thinking about energy. He's like, ah, you know, can't get it out of my head, the fact, energy consumption. So he always wanted to make a movie about climate change, and he managed to get some other um, fairly high-level folks involved, such as Eugene Jarecki, who's a major documentary filmmaker. But the, and, they, and they were, you know, he was filming it. It took over about a six-year period, but about three years into it, is when I told him I've got this other news. And at that point, he had discovered if there's going to be news, he's bringing the cameras along. So mm. you'll see he <laughs> filmed every major event. When I announced that I had cancer, you know, I called him. I said, Derek, can you come for dinner? He says, this is going to be as big a news as your <laughs> transgender. I said, probably bigger. I'm bringing a film crew. You know, so, he, so he would yeah. actually film his, the live reactions and the live uh, oh, changes wow. that would occur in the family. And our family agreed to do this. Really, because it's because it, it was an important part of our life, and and maybe it can contribute to the 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 positive evolution of humankind, right? If we yeah. if we get these words out. So he yeah. filmed this whole transition and event, and and what was amazing to me was Anoush, who's the uh, editor. She's done a lot of great movies. And she's a great editor. She really was. Uh, they were all really smart, but she did an incredible job of weaving together this story and connecting how a personal struggle with your gender is the same struggle we're having in the world with climate change. You know, we are in denial. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you, you, there are scenes in the movie where I talk about it. You know, this, this denial was going to kill me. Mm -hmm. And well, this did not, same thing with the planet, right? Denial's gonna kill us on the planet as well. And we, once, and humans have a hard time accepting these big issues we don't even know how to grapple with these huge issues. So we stay in denial. But once we deal with it, such as when I started seeing my transgender counselor, I never dreamed I could be as strong a leader as when I was Christine. Right. You just can't even imagine you're going to get there when you're starting the process. Same thing with climate change. You know, How can we solve this big problem? It's huge. Well, we can, and life will be better when we get to the other side. That's really the story. So, and what I'm hearing is there are small changes that we can make in our day-to-day -day lives so that we can move from denial into acceptance. Right. Um, and what are some of those small changes that we can make? Well, it, it's, so I'll, I'll hit the major, the major themes on carbon. You know, nationally, Vermont's, we have a very clean electric footprint, but nationally okay. about a third of carbon comes from electricity, about a third from transportation, and, and so, you know, the, a large percentage from heating and cooling, and our food choices make our, so it's all, it's all, if you think about your choices every day and what you purchase, you know, it's really understanding the carbon impact of, of, of each of those items. And, you, and, and it's not like you need to go out and become a PhD researcher. It's just s study a little bit, study a little bit, say, okay, I'm going to learn a little bit about the carbon impact of food. You know, for example, I would love to be a, a vegetarian, <laughs> but I love my steak. I love, but, you know, it's like, I just love a right. good burger. But when you have a steak, right. buying it locally so, yeah, from a, Yeah, you know, buy it locally. Think so about that, the that steak didn't come from Texas. The farm to plate initiative yes. is the, 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 the uh, fuel loading of trying to transport these all around the world. Yeah. You know, buying strawberries from New Zealand in January is probably Not carbon yeah. intensive. Mm -hmm. but, but again, it, it's, it's red meat has the bi biggest carbon impact, you know, and it starts going down the chain, chicken, and then you get to vegetables, you know, if you, if you can it's get like your protein. It's a food pyramid. It's a food pyramid. There's a carbon pyramid <laughs> yeah, with gotcha. the food, right? Yeah, it follows the food pyramid. And of course, if we, if we, we also, if we went to vegetarian diets and, and ate, you know, soy proteins and like that, we'd be healthier too. So it's, right. so the same thing that helps us from a health standpoint helps our climate. From a, so that's one example, right? Understanding yeah. the carbon loading of your food pretty much follows the same food pyramid. And then, you know, transportation is, for example, when I'm in a major city, I, I take mass transit. So, so I, I, and mass transit can be difficult. You know, the New York City subways are scary as hell at times, <laughs> but I still take them. You know, yeah. so I've got my, my, you know, my professional outfit on, and I've got my, dragging my suitcase line, and I'm getting on the subway, you know, and mm -hmm. sometimes you 
you know, get in the car and it smells pretty bad, just go <laughs> to the next car. But, you know, so it's really taking a taking a look at where where use mass transit where possible. You know, and, and uh, when you purchase your vehicle, purchase high, higher you know higher efficiency vehicles, those kind of things. It's all it's all there. Every choice you make, for example, lighting, LED lighting, replace your light bulb one light bulb at a time. Incandescent. Inter interesting story. The the incandescent bulb, the old traditional bulb. Yeah. Do you know that wastes ninety nine percent of the energy? It's really? less than one percent efficient. Yet the LED bulbs are in the seventy percent efficiency. So you could you could run seventy of those LED bulbs for one of those incandescent bulbs. Interesting. So so, so little things like that have big impact. So uh, so it's it's the light bulb you choose. It's the when you go buy an appliance. I'm Which always are actually even like cheaper. Aren't they? Isn't there? Well, like the LEDs are 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 cheaper in Vermont because we use some of our efficiency money to I subsidize see, them. I they see. are they are more expensive, <laughs> but again, we all you know we all have are in different places financially, so it's about what can you afford to do. Right. Right. Well, and that's also helping curbing those yeah. decisions to be made. Right. You know, right. people yeah. make decisions with their paycheck or with their wallet all, all the time. Yeah, so right. if mm -hmm. the better option is the cheaper option because of subsidies. I, uh, that's like kind of a genius idea. Yeah, and, and oh, by the way, so you think about it. Think about you as an individual. Say, well, I, d I don't have a lot of big impact. Yes, but collectively we do. Mm -hmm. I like to talk about the refrigerator. So one of the things I'm, one of the things we're working on is using appliances to help moderate the, the grid. And you know, if one refrigerator. I talk about um, the more the more we can manage our energy better as utilities, we can get more renewables onto the system. So, so right now in Vermont, we're being challenged because we have so much renewables, but not enough load. But the idea being, even a ref simple refrigerator, from my standpoint, I talk to people about, everybody likes their beer at 41 degrees, right? So, but you don't care if your refrigerator goes up to 43 degrees at some point or down to 37 degrees, another point. You know? So what, mm -hmm. what, we do, what, we, what I do as a utility manager is I look at that and say, you know, if I can start, um, Playing even with the temperature of the refrigerator by a few degrees, the consumer will never know. You're gonna, you'll give me permission to do that, but and one refrigerator alone doesn't do a lot. But if you've got thirty thousand refrigerators, it does a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, once you start doing that, then the marketers are going to respond and change the products, and they're going to start selling more efficient products. You know, making efficiency and uh, low carbon a pop popular. You know, once. Once we all start doing that, and 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 it's, of course, a lot starts in Hollywood, right? And but the, it is people are in Hollywood are aware aware of that now. Right. So it's, but it is about turning, you know, instead of you know like the big trucks in Lamoille County with those, you know, <laughs> the, what are they, coal uh -huh. the coal burners, the thing where they fire yep. the black stuff, you know, <laughs> that's like, if that's popular, then we're going the wrong way, right? Making efficiency and and low carbon and green popular. If that be, you know, people people have their images, and if we start forming that as the positive image, then we've changed. Right. So, if people want to learn more about all of this, where would you recommend for them to go? Wow, that is such an excellent question. <laughs> Thank does, you. Does <laughs> Denial have a website? You know, you know, it's funny. I, I tell our employees, everybody knows my trick. My trick, when it's a, when it's I say when I say it's a good question, that means I have an answer. When it's an excellent question, it means You've stumped the chump. Oh. <laughs> you know, that's a great point because I'm, a, I'm an, a recovering engineer and I do research all the time. Is there a simple place to go? You know, our denial website isn't even the place to go. And that's why that was such an excellent question. Maybe my son and I should start working on that. There, I'm there you go. Sure. I'm Gave sure, Derek another task. Yeah, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. You know, maybe go to 350.org. Maybe if that's there. But... I just don't know the answer to that question. There may not, I wonder if it's out there. Mm -hmm. So we will stay tuned for that yes. and <laughs> wait for the resource available. Right. But in the meantime, definitely check out Denial, the documentary, on iTunes and on Amazon. Right, yes, please. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Christine. We had a wonderful conversation, even if we're now like contemplating the next <laughs> 10 years of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> this methane, I will not sleep tonight. <laughs> right. Uh, nightmares. Yep. Literal and, and, you nightmares. You know, you contribute a little bit to methane, too, so just think about that when you eat your beans and all those things. Oh, things. yes, those vegetarian <laughs> meals that we Goodness. love so much. But I'm sure. sure that's a lot better. Locally sourced and organic. So we'll survive <laughs> the methane <laughs> implosion. That's good. All right. Awesome.